Stephen Farrow took the life of 77-year-old Betty Yates in her Riverside cottage and then six weeks later, he attacked Reverend John Suddards. Now, I'll tell you the full story and in this video, I want to ask you a question. The allegations that Stephen was abused by priests, if these are true, if these were proven to be correct, do you think his actions were justified? So if you do end up liking this video, please subscribe and follow me on Instagram. Links are in the description. I'd love to get to know you all better. So around January the 2nd, 2012, Stephen sends a text message to his friend. In this message, he says, the church are going to pay. He goes on to say, the church will be the first to suffer. It seems like he had a chip on his shoulder against priests and in actual fact, he first planned to travel to Canterbury with the intention of taking the life of Archbishop Rowan Williams, but he was put off by the level of security. So when it comes to Betty Yates, she was a widow. She lived alone, but she had a very active social life. She was struck so hard on the head by Stephen that the wood splintered. Stephen, who was a heavy cannabis user, then stabbed her with a knife just purely for pleasure and he left the knife in her neck. And it was six weeks later where he went to Mr. Suddard, who was 59 years old, and stabbed him seven times. When he's in the collision with the vicar, when he attacks the vicar, the vicar says to him, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And it is reported, Stephen said back to the vicar, well, fucking die then, I don't care. Now, after this, Stephen laid the body on the floor. He got a picture of Jesus, put it next to the body, and a mirror. He then scattered gay pornography all around the body as well as certain drugs. He also scattered condoms around the body and the whole point was to degrade the body and humiliate the vicar. And Pharaoh also confirmed that his initial plan was to crucify the vicar as in yes put him up on a cross and have him feel the wounds Jesus Christ faced himself. After he took the life of the vicar he went to the other room sat down had a beer and he watched Indiana Jones. I wonder what Harrison Ford makes of that. Now, it was reported before he committed these murders, you know, between January and February 2012, that he burgled a house sometime before. Now, this house was close to where the vicar lived, and it was what he left in the house that the police found curious. He left a note for the owners to read, and there was writing scribbled in red ink. The writing said, Be thankful you did not come back, or we would have killed you. Christian scum. I fucking hate God. See, Stephen claimed that when he was young, he was abused by priests. And this is why he had an aggressive attitude towards God. Now, the way the police found this initial burglary was linked to Stephen was through DNA evidence. They found a boot print in that house, matched it to the boot print in the house of Betty Yates and put two and two together. Now, what's interesting before I continue with the story is that when it came to the vicar, he admitted, yes, I didn't mean to kill him, but yeah, I was there. I did injure him. He claimed manslaughter, but with Mrs. Yates, he claimed he visited the pensioner, but nothing more. Now, after leaving the vicar early the next morning, having taken the life of the vicar, Farrow used his phone to send a text message, which read, RIP Mr. Suddard's. Farrow was eventually arrested on February 19th after a woman who he was staying with tipped off the police. He was assessed by mental health experts who claimed he was a pathological liar. He had a grandiose sense of self-worth, he was arrogant, opinionated and deemed dangerous and very dark. But given his sadistic and violent background, it's difficult to see how he's ever initially released from prison. Yes, he did spend time incarcerated before. See, he was diagnosed with psychopathic disorder and he attacked an elderly woman 18 years prior to 2012. See, for the trial at that time where he assaulted 77-year-old Stella Crow, the court heard he acknowledged that he had a dark side and he wanted treatment. Now, despite this and despite repeatedly telling the prison guards that he had a fantasy about taking the life of a husband in front of his wife, as well as, you know, committing more sexual assault and killing more people, he was actually freed in the year 2000. See, when he was young as a boy, Farrow was considered uncontrollable and there were early warning signs as he would torture and hurt animals, which is a telltale sign of psychopathy. See, what Stephen would do by the age of 10 and he would get some rags, you know, some cloths, set them on fire and put them through elderly ladies' letterboxes. This soon progressed to the arson of a church altar, which was the first sign of aggression towards Christianity. Prior 
to the double homicide, Stephen, throughout his life, appeared in court six times for offences including theft, burglary and deception. And in regards to the attack on Stella Crow, he was actually sentenced for eight years, which I mentioned previously, he was released in 2000. See, his first conviction came in 1979. He was 15 years old and he was convicted for burglary. And then he was placed on probation again for arson three years later in 1982. He was handed a partially suspended sentence for theft and deception in 1988 and then a 12-month prison term a year later for burglary again. In 1993, he was jailed for four years in Liverpool Crown Court for burglary, theft and deception. And after this sentencing in 1993, he was allowed to go on home leave, which they had back then. This is when he attacked Stella Crow. So, so far, all we're hearing, all I'm seeing, all you're being told, is just an idiot who would take stuff others had, wasn't willing to work himself, attack other people when he had the privilege of freedom, and then blame others for his own problems. See, Mrs. Crow and Betty Yates had similarities. They were both widows. They were both elderly women. Mrs. Crow suffered two black eyes, slashed hands and a missing tooth in the attack. And in all of this, all Pharaoh got out of it was a jar that he stole from the house that had £26 in it. Pharaoh himself was marked out as the black sheep in his family at birth. The youngest of six children, Pharaoh was the product of an unplanned pregnancy from his parents Reg and Doreen. His mother told the jury during, you know, the trial of Yates and the vicar, his mother said she knew her son was troubled from a very young age. She said that Stephen never slept properly and she went on to say that she would rather have her other five children all over again than have another Stephen because he was so difficult to handle. <sighs> Those are some very tough words. His unruly behavior during elementary school eventually had him sent to a special school that looked after juveniles or disruptive children as they called it back then but it was just a polite term for juveniles and Farrell spent two years at the school before you know he would return home on weekend visits. What's interesting though is Danny Bow, who is the nephew of Stephen he told the police and the jury during the trial that Stephen always had an anti-religious way. He was always against Christianity. He was always anti-church and there was something about the relationship between the mother and the father which explains why Stephen became what he did. See the dynamic in the family was that the mother, she loved Stephen but his father who was known to be aggressive and quite violent loved his other brother Colin a lot more. It was also said that Stephen's grandma was quite religious but his grandfather was anti-religious and it could have been seen that Stephen, when he was younger, was trying to impress his grandfather by also being very anti-religious. In 2012, it was reported that Farrell's mother was living in a nursing home and his father had died a couple of years prior. And I look at that and I think, what a life. Huh? You got a child that's become a murderer. You got a father who was violent and very aggressive. You now have got a mother who has none of her family. That's why she's in a nursing home. What a waste of a life. So there's no way to prove this allegations of, of abuse, but during the entire trial, there was not much that came from that. In the sense that when the police questioned Pharaoh, Oi, why'd you do this? Explain yourself. He just mentioned a few times, the priests abused me. I think Pharaoh had a propensity towards violence because that's the environment he grew up in. And it seemed that in a weird way, he would see violence and, and aggression as a vehicle to impress other people. This is just purely my guess. Pharaoh was eventually given a double life sentence and from all the evidence and all the research I've done, there's nothing or maybe like a 10% chance or a 5% chance that his claims of molestation were actually true. So on the basis of probability, he's probably telling a lie. And the anti-religious sentiment probably does come from his grandfather. And if he didn't, then he's just using it as an excuse instead of making the statement, I want to kill because I'm a sick fuck and I'm pissed off in life. He blames religion or other institutions for his own frailties. And even though he did try to appeal his sentence in the European, you know, Court of Human Rights, they said, fuck off, bruv. You kill two people and get your ass in jail. So why don't you guys comment and tell me what you think?